Hello, my name is Dr. Laura Levin, and I use the female pronouns she, her, and hers. I'm a board-certified pediatrician and addiction specialist, and I also have expertise in transgender medicine. Today, I want to talk about substance use and substance use disorder in the LGBTQ population. Let's start with some basic definitions. LGBTQ stands for lesbian, females who are attracted to other females, gay, males who are attracted to other males, bisexual, males or females who are attracted to both males and females, transgender, individuals assigned one gender at birth that does not match up with their own sense of their own gender, also known as their gender identity, and queer or questioning, populations who are sexual and or gender minorities that are not heterosexual and or cisgender. The opposite of transgender is cisgender, where an individual's gender identity does match up with their assigned sex. And that probably makes up about 98 or 99% of the population. People have come up with various ways to define their experience of their own gender. Importantly, gender identity and sexuality are independent of one another. Remember, it's never okay to casually inquire about one's sexuality, although medical providers frequently must do this to obtain the history Gender expression is the gender one shows to society, and gender transition is the process of dressing, taking hormones, or having surgery to arrive at the desired gender expression. Some people choose to take no steps to express their gender identity, for various reasons. It is usually best not to make any assumptions about an individual's gender identity or sexuality. And again, it's only okay to ask about surgeries in the context of a medical history not out of one's curiosity. What are the origins of discrimination? Well, people are born into a society where one's experience is based on average day-to-day -day encounters. Combine this with the tendency of the brain to generalize, make assumptions about various people and situations, and arrive at the concept of bias. Conscious biases are also known as prejudice if they are negative. Unconscious or implicit biases are ingrained habits of thought that lead to errors in how we perceive, reason, remember, and make decisions. Things that are common to implicit biases are that they are ubiquitous, they are distinct from conscious biases, they frequently don't align with our declared beliefs, they tend to favor the in-group or the group we are a part of, and they are malleable. So anyone that exists outside the norm is subject to explicit and implicit biases. This can lead to intentional and unintentional judgments related to age, race, religion, gender, national origin, disability, obesity, sexuality, and gender identity. Multiple studies across various disciplines, including healthcare, law enforcement, and advertising, show that unconscious bias is one of the leading causes of inequality in society. In healthcare, this manifests as a lower likelihood to recommend knee surgery to women, increased rates of long-term benzodiazepine prescriptions to elderly, despite geriatric society recommendations to the contrary, decreased rates of aggressive treatment of cancer in elderly, and lower rates of prescription pain medication provided to people of color, just to name a few. Ironically, these decreased rates of opioid prescriptions to people of color may have had a protective effect to that population in the current opioid epidemic. In LGBTQ patients, it may manifest as refusal of care. 1% of transgender patients report having been assaulted in physicians' offices, according to one. Now, how does this apply to the LGBTQ population? In 2011, an Institute of Health report found a paucity of research related to medical and mental health in LGBT community, including those related to substance use disorder. And while there were lots of research biases in studies up to that point, Evidence has shown that LGBT youth start earlier and are more likely to use tobacco, alcohol, and illicit substances compared to heterosexual youth. This holds true in adult populations as well. The National Center for Transgender Equality found much higher rates of substance use in transgender persons in comparison to the general population. The current best explanation for these increased rates of substance use and substance use disorder in LGBTQ population include the same risk factors that are associated with the general population, plus additional risk factors due to minority stress, prevalence of use in the community, and social isolation. 
Risks for all populations include biological factors, environmental factors, and factors related to the substance itself, such as ease of availability, route of administration, cost, and effect on the brain. Minority stress originates from the external stresses of experienced bias or discrimination in school, at work, by law enforcement, in medical facilities, and in churches, and at home or in housing. Minority stress, if prolonged and severe, leads to disruption in general psychological processes, as well as to internal stigmatization. These disruptions of general psychological processes include harmful coping mechanisms, decreased emotional regulation, or interpersonal function, and worsening cognitive function. It may be easy for you to see how any of these might lead to substance use. Other consequences of minority stress are related to the internal stigma related to the stressors, including the desire to conceal one's identity, the expectation of rejection, and internalized homophobia or transphobia, which is the false belief that lies, myths, and stereotypes taught to everyone in a heteronormative and cisnormative society are true. And these lead to higher incidences of anxiety and depression, emotional disorders, and substance use disorder. Not to mention increased marginalized work such as sex work, drug trade, higher rates of sexually transmitted infections, including HIV, lower levels of self-care, and higher rates of suicide. In one study, as many as 41% of transgender people have attempted suicide, 45% in transgender people of color. When LGBTQ individuals seek care, which is often delayed due to previous experiences of discrimination, they experience barriers to treatment, including limited availability of programs able to address culturally specific LGBTQ issues, social isolation and treatment, possibly leading to targeting by staff and patients, heteronormative side discussions, which exclude LGB patients, and lack of identification, leading to resistance to treatment by the patient. The goal in all our communities is to encourage resiliency which for the LGBTQ community is tied to affirming medical and psychological services. This leads to less psychological comorbidity, less dysphoria, and improved quality of life. We as providers can encourage resilience through the provision of evidence-based care services and through culturally competent care to our LGBTQ community. In the field of substance use disorder, there is great evidence for cognitive behavioral therapy, trauma-informed therapy, motivational enhancement techniques, and contingency management. For the transgender community member who wants to medically or surgically transition, we can use this fact as a motivation enhancer since many medical providers will not offer these services to people unstable in their substance use disorder as it reduces their ability to comply with the treatment. We can improve LGBTQ specific culturally competent care by creating safe and inclusive spaces through the use of things like a rainbow flag sticker or safe space sticker in a place a new patient can see upon presentation. This can be subtle, but they will almost certainly notice it, even if other patients don't. Providers' use of correct language, like asking the pronouns the person uses or introducing yourself with the pronouns, much like I did in my introduction. Also, ask about the patient's partner instead of husband, boyfriend, or wife, girlfriend. Next, it's important to communicate inclusivity through the use of forms that allow for variation in gender identity and sexuality. It is important that we don't tolerate microaggressions by calling out infractions as soon as one is made aware of them. Remember, it's crucial that we maintain confidentiality, as gay and transgender persons are victims of violence at much higher rates than the general population. And an inclusive staff best functions with an identified advocate on staff or better yet, an employee who is out and open, if possible. And finally, a session or two about culturally competent LGBTQ healthcare is a great start, but more education may be required, especially if this is not your area of expertise. You can continue to educate yourself through resources easily available online and listed in the description of this video.